Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. It's a nice weather and uh, nice to see you here all. Uh, when I saw the title of Benio, Artiste, uh, I smiled because Artiste in Lithuanian language is a jargon for being not serious. Like, <laughs> Artiste. To, so, like saying something not serious, although my texts are kind of serious and uh, this is why I smiled, it was kind of contradiction between my text and this nice venue with nice title. I write non-fiction, non-fiction, um, about things that seem fundamental to me and um, unrightly rule me and things that I cannot resist or change. So my first text is called The Silence of Mothers. It's about mixed marriages and about the problem of language in mixed marriages, about the lo loss of mother tongue. And um, it's a kind of reply to something that happened to me in Lithuania when I was trying to bring my children, which is, I mean, of mixed origin, Greek Lithuanian children, and raise them in Lithuania. And Lithuanian friends, Friends of mine perceived it as children without identity. So I wrote a text, The Silence of the Mothers, to try to, try to reply to this problem, to answer, um, to lift it to more global level, probably. So it's just a little piece of an essay, The Silence of the Mothers, um, translated by Darius Ross. I have never witnessed a gloomier scene, a mother sitting silently amid her children who are twittering away in a foreign language, or a mother whose vocabulary in her adopted tongue consists of a sum total of five words, muttering something along the lines of you, me, come, give hand, mommy, are you by any chance a mommy? mocks the snotty child of a Lithuanian mother and the Greek father while she, during a lively Greek conversation, keeps strangely mum. Who is this mummy? How does she feel? Can she play with words? Can she, a mute, offer other than infinite and unyielding boredom? The mother is passive, alone and self-contained, but the environment, with its sounds and colors, is a fast-paced, magical, Harry Potter-like kaleidoscope. Children born outside the space of their mother's native language, or their mother's homeland, disavow their mothers as soon as they learn to walk. Children, even little pipsqueaks, manage to jump across the chasm separating their mothers from their locale with such alacrity that the mother from a strange land ends up stranded on the other side before she can even manage a cask. If she wants to keep pace with her offspring in a foreign linguistic environment, she has no choice but to become a child herself, spry, receptive, and tomboyish. Surrounded by the echoes of Sirtaki rhythms, all hopes of suckling the child in its, on its mother's tongue come to nothing. The great mother archetype that is to say, the mother's thirst to dominate her child linguistically at any cost is common only to romantics and anarchists. But even such a trait would not be enough to save these mothers from the verdict of silence, because it is the place cannibal that in the end decides the child's language. Continuously plying the same route, Lithuania, Greece, Cyprus, I meet dozens, no hundreds of Lithuanian girls who have become the wives of foreign men and the mothers of their children, and who have never really spoken any other language than their mother tongue. The biological clock hurries them along. Sadly, the time devoted to children and husbands is irretrievable. And how do you talk to each other? I ask one long-legged beauty queen at the airport. And she, flashing a pearly white smile, answers. Who needs language? I have fingers. Sometimes I have to sketch things if they've got convoluted. But anyway, listen, on, on the home front, you know, silence is golden. And in bed, well, we make enough sounds. <laughs> oh, one Greek acquaintance related the impressive story of his trip to the land, land of penguins, penguins, 
which is how Lithuania seemed to him from the airplane, to propose to his chosen one armed with only a single declarative sentence in English, I love you. The woman of his dreams knew no more English than he did. After experiencing cultural and intestinal shock from Lithuanian hospitality, his feet clad in, in, clad in his southerner's shoes, frozen, high hopping from the robotic I love you, proffered in any and all situations, he nonetheless hauled his woman away with him. His scheme fell into place. The couple married, settled in the land of the Greeks, he had kids, and are still living together in their mystical linguistic circumstances. Their children don't speak Lithuanian, the mother speaks no Greek, though she's picked up a smattering of English. I know hundreds of stories like theirs. Yes, feelings can mean more than words, more than the person herself knows about them. But I'm left wondering how one expresses them without language. Language likes to torment, but not suffer. And during the course of time, it takes its own back. It outweighs and takes its revenge on the little mermaid for her beautiful legs, turning her inner world to permafrost. Mothers who are unable to talk to their children in their native language feel a piercing nostalgia, one for which there is no analgesic, just as there is no possible return of the ship Motherlandia. And uh, another essay called The Metaphor, it's a reply to my husband who found letters in my computer and those letters were to another man whom I liked and uh, <laughs> needless to say it's, it affected our relationship. <laughs> no, the text is not funny, it's just the situation, it's funny. You said, um, I came across your files containing the letters in the PC. You just can't do without the letters. And who doesn't use computers for writing letters these days? Doesn't travel, doesn't live in mixed marriages, and doesn't speak several languages. Letters in the PC are contemporary technologies production for the past. Production because letters found in the PC can be duplicated infinitely, copied and saved into files. Letters such as those don't go anywhere, they pile up and multiply. Production for the past, because letters always move in the direction of the past, regardless of the speed of technological change. Don't grieve. Letters in the PC aren't really letters. They are texts in the form of letters written in a language you don't understand. When someone doesn't understand language, he is like a small child who apprehends the world through forms, though not all that is sharp cuts. Texts written using a computer, whether sent or not, faithfully remain. The monitor quickly takes on your features, and in the end, no one knows better than it does how you truly feel. No one has spoken yet, in as visionary a manner as technology has, about a person's deep-seated necessity for intimacy. No one has expressed more clearly than technology the human goal of globalization and expansion. Let's be together, it's just so simple. We were protagonists of globalization. We were the protagonists of the distance game. When the PC was only knocking at our door, we were whirling in the heat of the game. We ignored borders, played with more than just letters, but with languages, homelands and careers. We chose that which was not mine, not yours, but that belonged to third parties. We believed in the magic of no man's land. We wrote letters to one another in a foreign language. Our feelings and many go-betweens and spaces, many codes and sides, a lot of impossibility. You said, strange, why haven't they thrown your letters away until now? They haven't been thrown because we are their creations. In my letters, you are clear, whole, and legible to yourself. All that I write is understandable to you. Our epistolary side is what most clear we have between us. After all, you wouldn't conserve and cherish lack of clarity, just as, as you wouldn't a confused partner of text. The aim of clarity is a meaningful path. Letters without a clear subtext intended for you are as unreliable as diplomatic abstractions. 
You cherish only what is intended for you personally. You preserve not the letters, but the genre. Personal genres are not perfect, however they bribe us with their promise of fidelity and all-inclusiveness. Fidelity to the genre is more important than perfection. You don't throw away letters as you don't toss aside the genre in which every one of us is the personal author of the other. Even those writers who have forgotten the mission of personal writer are hard to read. In our epoch, as during the age of the ancient Greeks, there is nothing impersonal. Culture suffers and not insignificant loss if it requires from writing more than the personal. Worldliness. Worldliness comes down to us from the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks represent what is most clear about us. It's logical that culture seeks clarity, but the ancient Greeks' worldliness was born out of that which is personal. Up to the present, we envy them their lives in which the letters was a form of pleasure. You don't throw away letters as you do a pleasure intended for you. The epistolary genre is a pleasure of a relationship that you were fated to experience. We live once only, and because of this singularity, it is possible to stay faithful to only one genre. Fidelity to one means going down to defeat before the others. On the other, no one can feel secure among several genres. As long as you keep the letters, you will feel secure, as behind the closed door, as long as there are the letters, the door will remain closed. The letters I adore that separates us, the genre of our relationship. An inability to live otherwise, an inability to speak to one another in a way so that the utterance stinks deeper than writing. Thank you.